Hi, my name is Catherine O'Mahony. I'm a School and College Engagement Officer from the University of Exeter, and I'm going to talk to you about choosing a course. Before we get on to that, I just want to give you a brief introduction to the University of Exeter. We are a Russell Group University based in the southwest of England. We have two campuses in the city of Exeter, which is in Devon, and also another campus in Penryn, which is in Cornwall. Um, so that area of the southwest is a very beautiful part of the country known for a high quality of life. And we also have very beautiful campuses as well. We're generally in the top 10 to 20 percent of UK and international league tables. Uh, in the last Teaching Excellence Framework, we achieved a solid gold award so that the overall gold rating was, was underpinned by us receiving gold ratings in the other aspects of the assessment. And we were one of four Russell Group institutions to achieve that alongside Cambridge, Oxford and Warwick. Other things we're known for, we are the top sporting university in the south of England. So we have some really great sports facilities. We are renowned for our pioneering climate change research, which has won us awards, and we're home to the UK's five most influential climate scientists. OK, so on to choosing a course. So we're going to go through the types of options that are available to you for higher education, and there are a lot. We'll look at how you can develop approaches to narrowing, it, that, narrowing that down and making the right choice for you. We'll focus on some of the key factors you might want to take into account and then look at what you should do next. We'll start by looking at course options. For context, I want to start by talking about course levels and the types of courses you can do at university. So if you're at sixth form or college, then you are probably currently studying a level three course, such as A-levels, IB diploma or a T-level or a level three BTEC. So beyond that, all the levels above that are all higher education level courses. Levels four to seven, sorry, level four to six are what we call undergraduate level. So undergraduate degree is the, the first type of degree you would do after sixth form or college. The most common type of undergraduate degree is called a bachelor's degree, and that's probably what most of you will progress on to. You might have seen abbreviations like BA or BSc after degree titles and BA stands for Bachelor of Arts and BSc stands for Bachelor of Sciences and they're very broad definitions of, of arts and sciences. So arts can include humanities subjects like English, history and languages and sciences can also include subjects like maths and computing and sociology. And there are other abbreviations you might come across as well for different bachelor's courses. For example, BMBS is Bachelor of Medicine. Um, it doesn't stand for it in English because it's actually um, it relates to a Latin term, but it does basically mean Bachelor of Medicine. There are other types of undergraduate programmes that aren't bachelor degrees. Examples that you might come across include foundation degrees or HNDs, which you can see on the slide are on level at level five. Um, these are often called HTQs by the government, higher technical qualifications. So they, they tend to be shorter than bachelor degrees and they you graduate at a lower level. However, it is sometimes possible to start off doing an HND or a foundation degree and then progress on to a bachelor's degree afterwards. Most bachelor's degrees take three years, or this this can vary though. There are some courses that are four years because they involve an extra study abroad year or an extra work experience year. And also medicine often takes five years, although it can take six because there are some courses that offer an extra year um, of study or work, which is called an intercalation year. I also want to mention degree apprenticeships because they can also come at all these, these different, le different levels um, up to level seven. They usually take four to six years, and that's because you're studying and working at the same time. Now looking at the course subjects. Now we've looked at the different types of qualification and the levels. Let's look at subjects. There is a huge, huge range of subjects that you can study at university. If you look at the UCAS site, you will see that each year there are over 33,000 different degree programmes listed, which probably feels overwhelming, but we are going to discuss how you can narrow that down. So you can start by grouping courses in different ways. For example, you can divide 
into different academic or different subject areas. And that's what I've got on this slide. And this is just examples of how you can group subjects. So we've got humanities, which includes uh, English languages, as I said earlier, history, theology, business can include management, economics, accounting, health and social care could include medicine, nursing, uh, radiography, social work, youth work. Life and environmental sciences could include subjects like biology, zoology, geography and psychology. Maths, engineering and physical sciences can include computer science, physics, astronomy, renewable energy. Social sciences can include sociology, of course, but also law, uh, politics and education. And then creative arts and media are probably fairly, fairly obvious, but like journalism, art and design, drama, music, etc. So as I said, this is just one way of grouping courses, but having a broad list like this can be useful because even if you're not sure exactly what subject you wanna do, you might see a list like this and think, well, there's, there's some of those categories that you do feel interested in and some that you're definitely not, or maybe there's some that you want to find out a bit more about. And universities themselves generally group similar subjects together because they will have different academic faculties or departments or colleges. Another way of grouping subjects is academic versus vocational. So you can see on the left hand of the slide here, we've got academic subjects, which are ones that you've probably come across in school or college. Um, so again, you've got English, history, sciences, languages, maths, and so on. But you also have vocational courses at universities, sometimes called applied courses. And these are designed more specifically to prepare you for a particular job or a particular job sector. And they include courses such as engineering, business, law, medicine, veterinary science, games design, and many more. With vocational courses, it's a good idea to check if uh, any professional accreditation is required if you want to move on to a particular job after that, that course. So for example, if you want to become a psychologist, you need to do a psychology degree that's accredited by the British Psychological Society. Another vocational option is, of course, degree apprenticeships because they are training you to do a particular job and they can be a great option for some people who are sure what they want to do because um, you get paid, you get, there's no student debt, you don't have to pay tuition fees. But it is worth mentioning that there are much, much fewer degree apprenticeships out there than there are full time university places. So they can be very competitive and also they are demanding. You do need great time management skills. If you're interested in a few different subjects and you really can't narrow it down to one, you might want to consider a combined or a joint degree. These usually involve studying two different subjects, although how each subject is weighted might vary. It might be a 50-50 split, or it might be more weighted towards one subject, or it might be that you can kind of choose depending on what modules you, you pick as you go through the course. Some universities offer other flexible courses. We do a unique course called Flexible Combined Honours or FCH for short. And if there's a combined degree or two subjects you're interested in doing and you, and you can't really see them available as a ready made combination, then FCH enables you to, to basically build your own degree as long as it works, as long as the timetable fits and as long as you meet the entry requirements for the different courses. We and other universities also offer natural sciences, and that enables you to study all three sciences, biology, chemistry, and physics, alongside maths and computer science. And again, you might be able to specialize in one of those as, as you go through the course, depending on the modules you choose. And we also offer liberal arts and other universities offer this as well. It is um, like an American model where you study a whole range of subjects, but you choose to major in one. So you have one major subject and a load of minor subjects. So now let's look at the different approaches that you can take to choosing a course. Now you have an idea of the kinds of courses that are out there. The most important thing is that you choose based on what matters to you and where you're at in your in your career journey, because that's not going to be the same for everyone. We'll start off looking at career ambitions. When you're choosing what to do at university, it is important to consider what your career ambitions are. Um, if you're clear about them, you might you might not be, and that's okay, we'll come to that. Um, but it might be that you've got a career in mind that you need to do a specific degree for, like uh, some of the ones I've mentioned, like medicine, engineering, psychology. Or it might be that you're interested in a subject because 
you've done some research and you know that it can link to a, to a several different careers that might interest you or you know that it can lead to high earnings and that's important to you. You might also be uh, interested in the kind of work experience that a university can offer. I mean, I did mention that you can do courses that in involve a year of work experience. That's often called a sandwich course. Um, but also universities do have career services where they can offer other work experience opportunities like internships, volunteering, a lot of students work part time as well. So there's lots of ways that you can improve your career prospects at university as well as the subject you're doing. And some of the opportunities, opportunities I talked about, like the internships, the, the courses that involve a year of work experience, you can do those when you're studying an academic subject as well. It doesn't have to be a vocational subject. Passion for learning is another motivation for choosing a particular course. It may be that you've got a subject that you really love and you just want to take your knowledge to a higher level in that subject. That could lead to a career. It might be that you become a leading academic or an expert in that field, um, but it might be just that you don't have a career in mind yet. So you're just following your passion for the subject. And that's fine, because if it's something you're passionate about, you're likely to enjoy it. You're likely to be motivated and you're more likely to, to do well in your degree. And any degree course should enable you to develop some transferable skills anyway, no matter what it is. A transferable skill is a skill that you've, you've built up in one area of your life and you can transfer it to another area of your life. And there are lots of ways you can do this at university, not just in your degree course, but in, as I said, volunteering internships. But there's lots of other social activities and sports and things that you can get involved with at university as well. It's also worth mentioning that just having a degree in any subject opens up lots of career options to you regardless. I mean, actually, the majority of employers who take on graduates don't mind what subject those graduates study. So having a degree can make you employable in many areas. Life experiences might be important to you as a reason for, for choosing a university course. I've talked about studying abroad for a year. It might be that that's important to you to get experience a new culture for a year as part of your course. I've also mentioned some of the other extracurricular activities that you can get involved in universities. I mean, we have a, a student union that has over 400 clubs and societies that you can choose from. And these cater for a huge range of interests, activities, communities, cultures and faiths. So just to give you some examples. We've got student societies dedicated to yoga, football, fundraising, hip hop, political parties, LGBTQ plus students, Pokemon, sailing, belly dancing, feminism, African Caribbean students, Muslim students, anime and manga, debating and hide and seek. So you can see that there's a whole load of life experiences you can get at university. Some courses also involve field trips where you, you go out and apply your learning and that by going on trips in like the UK or even abroad as well. It might be that you're really sporty and you, and you want to get involved in sport at university. So we, we have um, sports opportunities available at all levels. So you might be a really high level athlete or you might be someone that just wants to get involved in sport and fitness for fun. But all of these kinds of things, they're all life experiences. They can all help you develop as a person. And they are that those life experiences are an important part of university as well. To look at it more specifically, there are two main approaches you can take to choosing a university subject if you're not sure. So we've got a subject led approach, which is on the left side of the slide and a career led approach, which is on the right side of the slide. So the subject led approach means looking at your A levels or whatever you're studying now and see what degree courses they can possibly feed into. And it's often more than you think, um, because there are a lot of degree courses that where it doesn't matter what you study for A levels. So, for example, if you chose to study law or sociology at the University of Exeter, there are no subject specific A level requirements. We just look at what grades you've got. So. Yeah, whatever A levels you do, there's certain courses that you can get onto at university anyway. But you also might want to think about what degree courses are linked with your A levels. Um, and there are websites that can help give you suggestions on this. For example, the Uni Guide, and there's another site called SACU. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's S A C U. They both have A level matching tools, which are quite useful. So you can see on the slide that we've got maths, biology, and geography, 
as example A levels. And then we've got a list of, um, and this is definitely not a comprehensive list, but it's just some examples of degree programs that those subjects could lead to. And they are just example degrees that we offer at the University of Exeter. And if you take this subject led approach, as you go through your education, you'll, you'll get more experience of what topics interest you. You'll start to learn what your strengths and weaknesses are. You'll gather more work experiences. You'll hopefully use all the, the wealth of careers advice and support available to you at university. And then by the time you graduate, hopefully you'll have some kind of idea of, of what you want to do. And as I already said, just having a degree can open up lots of career, uh, lots of career pathways. And then we've got the career led approach, which is kind of you kind of do that in reverse. So if you've got a job that you want to do, then you start with that. You, and you look at what degree subject do I need to get into that job? If I do need one, am I doing the right A-levels or equivalent now that are going to get me into that? Um, and you go from there, basically. And we've got examples of nurse and doctor on the slide. So for doctor, um, if you want to do that medicine at university, then for us, for the University of Exeter, you need to be studying biology and chemistry. This can vary a bit across different medical schools, though, so do make sure you check across different universities and don't don't assume that we're all the same in terms of our entry requirements. It's also worth mentioning that with some of these careers, there are alternative routes. So, for example, you can get into nursing through an apprenticeship or if you decide you want to be a doctor, but you're already at university and you're not studying medicine, there is graduate entry routes to medicine. So there are there are often other ways as well. So let's say you've done all that research and narrowing things down and you've now chosen a subject you want to study at university. That's brilliant, but it doesn't stop there. So, uh, you know, you might have just decided you want to do history, but not all universities offer the same history course. And there are also different courses in terms of like combined courses, different areas of history, some courses that might have a study abroad year or a work experience year. So there's lots of lots of things to think about. So on the slide, we've got history as an example. There are roughly on the UCAS system at the moment, there are roughly two and a half thousand history courses offered by over 150 higher education institutions. So you have to think about how you're going to narrow it down from here. And there's a lot of things you can do to help you narrow it down. You can look at the course content, different courses. So you can look at the modules. Every different history course at different universities will have a different choice of modules. Um, remember that there may be a lot of choice at the University of Exeter. There is a lot of choice. Um, you might also want to look at who the academics are that are teaching the subject at that university and, and what are their research interests, because they might be researching areas of history that really interest you. And then you'll be you'll be getting taught the, the, the latest knowledge that, that they've been um, researching. You might want to look at the structure of the course. So things like how is it taught? Um, in terms of lectures versus seminars versus tutorials versus how much independent study, how much practical work. And you also might want to look at how it's assessed. Like, is it mainly coursework? Are there exams? Are there other assessment methods like project work, for example? And as I mentioned, you might be interested in combining that subject with something else. So if we take history at the University of Exeter, you can see there that we've actually got nine different history courses across two different campuses. So um, <laughs> there's, there's still quite a lot of narrowing down to do. Um, and actually, it's more than nine, really, because you can also take history as part of flexible combined honours, the programme I mentioned, and as part of liberal arts. And we also offer related subjects such as archaeology and art history. Now, you can see on the slide that we offer straight history at two different campuses at our Streatham campus in Exeter and also our Penryn campus in, in Cornwall. Now, those campuses are like two hours apart, so they are entirely different courses. The two campuses are very different, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. So they involve different modules. They're taught by different academics and they also have a separate code on the UCAS system. So, um, yeah, they're just very separate in, in every way. So um, you'd want to look at the differences between the two courses and the differences between the campus. And, and also you would want to look at the different combinations just to see if any of those interest you. So let's talk a little bit more about location now. 
So even though you've narrowed down your subject, how do you choose where to study when there are so many universities and other types of higher education institutions? There are over 300 in the UK, as I think I've said. So obviously the courses on offer, the differences between them in terms of the modules, the structure of the course and all that stuff that I've talked about, that's one way of looking at differences between universities. The other thing to look at is the location of the university. You might want to stay local and live at home in London, as you do now, um, or you might want to experience another part of the country. You might even want to go further afield and look at a university abroad. The location might also be directly relevant to your subject. So, for example, studying marine science in inner London might not offer the same opportunities as studying it in Cornwall when you're right by the coast. And likewise, studying music business management in inner London might offer you more opportunities than a coastal town like in Cornwall, because you've got lots of um, record companies and studios, etc., based in London. The other thing you might want to consider is, is the type of university, because we have universities that are campus based and universities that are city based. So a campus based university means that all of the provision like the accommodation, the university buildings, the, the teaching venues, the sports facilities, the libraries, the places to eat, the student union are all on one site, all on one campus. Whereas in a city based university, normally all the different buildings and facilities are spread out around a particular area of a city centre. Some people like the idea of a campus university because it's like a little student community. Some people kind of like that. Maybe it kind of feels safer, kind of sheltered from from the surrounding area, whereas a city based university, you are more immersed in the life of that city. And when you're walking from one university to another, you, you are just walking down a public street with with members of the public. Um, there are some universities where you can kind of get the best of both worlds. I mean, our our university is campus based, so we have two campuses in Exeter and they both have a whole range of facilities on them, including accommodation and places to eat and sports facilities and all of that. But they are also in a city and the uh, one of our campuses, the St Luke's campus, is really close to the city centre. And the other one, the Streatham campus, is just a short walk. It's about 15 minute walk from the city centre. So actually you, you kind of get the best of both worlds. But that's something to consider. So in terms of location, you also want to think about if, you, if you're going to move away from home, you want to think about how far away from home do you want to be? Because you are going to want to come back sometimes, either in some weekends or in the university holidays. So it's important to look at how far away it is. Um, so I've got a little question here. How long do you think it takes to travel from London to Exeter by train? The correct answer is two hours. People often think it's longer than that, because when you look at it on a map, it actually looks quite a bit further. As you can see here, London and Exeter look quite far apart. Um, but actually, we do have fast trains from London Paddington and it's just over two hours. And it's the same train line, actually, that will take you to our Penryn Cornwall campus, which is um, that's further out. That's just over four hours. So what I'm saying is don't just look at a map. Do also look at Google Journey Planner or something and look at how long it takes to get to different places. Now, if you're in London, then obviously you have lots of universities on your doorstep. There's like 40 odd higher education institutions in London and it's a big global city. There's lots of facilities and things to do as well. Um, you might decide you want to stay and you want to stay living at home and that's absolutely fine. You've got to choose what's right for you. But I just wanted to go through some possible reasons to to, to study away from London. So first of all, moving out of home means that you're more independent because you're more looking after yourself, you're paying your own bills, you're budgeting, um, doing your own cleaning, you might be cooking for yourself, all that kind of stuff. So it's all those life skills. You'll be broadening your horizons because you'll be experiencing a new place, possibly a new lifestyle, um, because somewhere like Cornwall, for example, has a very different lifestyle from London. And you're also stepping out of your comfort zone and stepping out of our comfort zone is good for improving our confidence. Other things you might want to consider in terms of location are living costs. We are in a cost of living crisis. Um, there are different places have different living costs. So that's something you can research online. But basically everywhere is cheaper than London. Um, some places more than others. You also might want to consider the air quality as well, because this has an impact on, on your well-being. Um, London does have quite a high level of air pollution. 
And I can say that because I live in London too. But um, there are other areas where it's much cleaner. And I definitely notice when I visit Exeter and Cornwall that the air does feel a lot cle cleaner. You might want to look at crime rates. Uh, there's some areas of London that have quite high crime rates. Um, not, it's not the highest. There are other places that are worse. But you might want to go somewhere where you feel safer. And you also might want to consider the pace of life as well. London is a big global city. It has quite a fast pace of life. Most other places are a little bit more relaxed and, and you might prefer that. You know, it might be better for your mental health. So the other thing is that you might not be sure. You might not be sure how you're going to find somewhere else compared to London or compared to what you're used to. But university also gives you a chance to try out something different because you don't have to stay there forever. Like I say, most degree courses are three years. So it just gives you a, an idea, a, a chance to try things. OK, so going back to differences between universities. So we've talked about courses on offer. We've talked about location and distance. Now, the other sorts of things you might want to think about are league tables. Um, you might have seen university league tables. There are lots of different ones like the Guardian and the Times and the Complete University Guide. And these are ways of ranking universities according to different criteria. And the different league tables don't all use the same criteria and they can be different each year. So you should have your critical thinking hat on when you're using league tables, but they can be useful. You also might want to think about what else the university offers as well. So what kind of support does it offer, for example? Um, what kind of accommodation is available to you? Um, what kind of activities are there to do in your spare time? So I've, I've already touched on this, so I, I won't say too much about activities in your spare time. But in terms of support services, that could be things like what kind of career service does the university have? Do they have disability support? Uh, or what kind of disability support will they have if that's important to you? Um, what about mental health and well-being support? Um, or what about religious um, support? So most universities will have support in all of these areas, but it's, it's good to explore um, what they have. The other thing you might want to look at is like the ethos and values of the university, because every every university is different. Um, so our main values at the University of Exeter are around like health, um, climate change and sustainability and also social justice. And I'm just going to show you a short video now. You can feel it here. From the people and the places to finding your place. This is where it's all possible. Because while everyone else talks about a better tomorrow, we're committed to making it happen. And you can be part of it. You can be part of this. When you're part of the University of Exeter, you'll help make the world greener, healthier and fairer. You'll know that green is more than the colour we wear. We live by it. You'll stand as proud on the pitches as you will in our lab, studios and lecture theatres. In fact, you'll take that feeling everywhere you go because everywhere is where our commitment to a better future is coming to life. You'll join the pursuit of new knowledge. You'll find your voice and you will be heard. Our education welfare team and wellbeing service ensure that mental health support is available when our students need it, so that they can continue to thrive. When you're part of this place, then this community, our shared values become part of you, woven into who you are and what you achieve. Whether you're reaching out with the country's largest university volunteering society, or you're digging deep into inequalities and how we can resolve them. Together, we will lead the way to a green, fair, and socially just future. And that feeling of knowing it's all possible, that's what it feels like to be part of the University of Exeter. So this video 
hopefully kind of brings to life some of what I'm talking about. So you can see um, some of the things I've talked about that are distinctive about the University of Exeter, like our values, the support we offer, the kind of activities you can get involved in, um, the beautiful scenery and the beautiful campuses. And this is just to give you an example, but of course you can look for information and videos and things like this for other universities as well. So on the previous slide, the last thing I had to consider when you're choosing a university is entry requirements. But that's last, I've put it last, but it's definitely, definitely not least, because it's really, really important to check university entry requirements to make sure that you have a realistic chance of being accepted at that university, because they do really, really vary. You can look at a summary of university entry requirements on the UCAS website for the, for the course that you're interested in, but usually there'll be more detail given on the university's own website. So universities will usually ask for particular grades for A-level or whatever you're studying at the moment, and they may, depending on the course, specify particular subjects. As I said, there are some courses like law or sociology that where we don't, for, for us, we don't ask for particular subjects, but then there are other courses like medicine where we do, and this is the same for all universities. There might be some A-level subjects that, that some universities don't accept at all. So, for example, we don't accept general studies. There also might be some universities that don't accept resits if you had to resit your exams. We are absolutely fine with resits, but some universities are not so much. The entry requirements can vary uh, every year. So it's not just by university that they vary, but they can vary each year. So it's really important that, to make sure that you're looking at the most up to date information, which is normally what's on the university website and on the UCAS website as well. So for A-levels or equivalent, some universities will specify a particular grade combination, such as AAB, but others may use a system called the UCAS tariff, which is a point system. So with that point system, an A grade at A-level is 48 points and a B is 40 points. So AAB would be 136 UCAS tariff points. And UCAS has a tariff calculator on their website to help you with this. Um, some universities use that tariff system, some don't. We don't. We will just make you a grade offer. Sometimes there are additional requirements to think about, like, for example, if you do medicine, not only do you need to achieve particular grades, but you also need to do an admissions test. You also need to attend an interview. And then on top of that, you would have to do like a DBS police check, because when you're on clinical placement, you'd be working with vulnerable adults and you'd also have to do um, some kind of medical check as well. Um, similarly, if you apply for a performing arts course, you might need to do an audition. If you apply for an art and design course, you might need to submit a portfolio. There are other courses that sometimes interview or ask for admissions tests, and this, this does vary. So again, just make sure you're checking all the entry requirements for the university courses that you're interested in. It might be possible in some instances that you might be eligible for a reduced offer for a, from a university if you meet particular requirements. So, for example, if you're studying core maths or the EPQ, the extended project qualification at the University of Exeter, we think those those courses are a really good preparation for university. So if you've studied one of those and you've achieved an A in, in one of them, then we will reduce the offer we make you by one grade. Some other universities um, have things like that as well. So again, make sure you check if, if you're studying like core maths or EPQ. You might have also heard of contextual offers. And again, universities vary with this, but uh, contextual offers are about recognising that some, some students have some more advantages than others in terms of the context that they've been studying in. And it's about levelling up the playing field, really. So it's, it's a way of looking at potential as well. Um, so different universities have different criteria. A lot of universities use different types of postcode criteria. So, for example, if you live in a postcode area where um, there's a lot of low income households or where not many people progress to university, then you might be eligible for a reduced contextual offer. Similarly, if you've been in care 
or if you're a refugee or asylum seeker, if you've been in free school meals, all of those things might make you eligible for it as well. Also, if you've taken part in certain programmes um, with us, we, we run a, a programme called Exeter Scholars, for example, and that's a, a widening participation programme that includes a summer residential and lots of other activities. But if you complete that programme, then you'll also be eligible for a reduced grade contextual offer. So you can check this, like a lot of universities have like a, a mini sort of checker tool on their site where you can see if you're eligible for a contextual offer with them. We do have that on our site. You can just Google um, Exeter contextual offers. OK, so I'm nearly at the end now. In terms of next steps, there's loads of places you can go to get useful help and support with, with choosing a course. And I've got um, a load of different websites on here informedchoices.ac.uk that's actually aimed at year 10 and 11 students who are looking ahead to university particularly Russell Group universities but it has got some features on there that would be useful for students who are at sixth form or college as well um, you might also want to look at careers websites especially if you're taking that career-led approach I said and you've got a career in mind and you want to check if you need to do a particular degree or if you're doing the right A-levels so you might want to look at the national careers website or also prospects.ac.uk um, that latter site, prospects.ac.uk, that actually has a really useful feature called what can I do with my degree, where you type in a degree subject and then it will tell you what kind of careers that degree might, might lead to. And they're not always obvious, so that can be useful as well. The uni guide um, includes a tool where you put your A-level subjects in and it tells you what degree subject it link links to. I think I mentioned that one earlier. Of course, the UCAS site and of course, um, universities own websites have lots of advice and information that's important as well. It's also a really good idea to see a careers advisor and speak to teachers, friends and family who've been to university, who've been through this process. And another thing that's that's really good idea is to get experiences of university life as well. And that will help inform your choice. So universities tend to offer taster lectures. Some of them might be in person, in which case you might want to look at London universities. But also a lot of universities offer online lectures as well. So you could um, go attend lectures anywhere in the world. Um, you might want to do free online courses. And again, this is a way of you accessing universities all over the country and all over the world. And also, it's, it's a really good idea to um, go to university open days as well, once you've narrowed down um, a short list of, of universities that you're most interested in. Another thing that's a good idea is to maybe try and chat to current university students and staff so you, so you can ask them specific questions. You might be able to go to an HE fair to meet them or many websites, including ours, have a web chat facility where you can chat to current students who are studying a subject that you're interested in and ask them what it's really like. OK, so I just wanted to, before I finish, just um, flag up a few other things that we offer that might be of interest at the University of Exeter. So we, under our Discover University brand, we run free online Zoom sessions throughout the year, which cover all kinds of topics related to applying to university and university life. The next one we've got coming up is specifically to give you more information about the University of Exeter if you're interested in us. And that's a half day event, which is on Saturday, the 22nd of June. But as I said, there are lots of other things that go on all throughout the year. Um, I mentioned University Open Days. We've got some coming up at the end of May 2024 and early June. We tend to have open days again in uh, usually October half term. They do tend to get booked up early, so it is a good idea to, to look ahead of time if you're interested in that. Um, you can scan the QR code for the free online events that I talked about, and you can just Google Exeter Open Days to find out about the open days. And finally, if you'd like to sign up to our mailing list, then do scan the QR code on this slide. You'll get lots of information through um, through email, which will be of interest to you, hopefully, if you're interested in Exeter, but also just general tips for applying to university. And you'll also get entered into a prize draw to win a hoodie. OK, and that is everything from me. I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much and good luck in your journey to higher education.